time for our mystery guest. She has sold over a million books in the Netherlands, and then we're not even counting her third. She loves tulips and windmills, and she lets her books premiere in the Netherlands. Shout as loud as you can. <laughs> Go mental, because here is... Donna Tart! <laughs> Hello. Hi. Let's start. Can you start seat? There we are. So you you just you just arrived. Um, maybe it's it's good to take a moment to soak in in all the the people who are here. Maybe everybody can say hello to you. Yeah. Hello, Donna. Hi. Hi. <laughs> really good. So this show is about uh, a guest cho choosing his fa favorite book. And you've chosen a book by Charles Dickens. And uh, before we start discussing that book, maybe it's good to do a little check. Because we all know the name Charles Dickens, and we all know the, the movies of Charles Dickens, like Christmas Carol. And, but who of you in this, in this uh, church has actually read a book by Charles Dickens? Please raise your hand. There are a lot uh, of hands. Wow. Yes. Did you good finish job. it? Good job. <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> But it's still, Go it's, it's, it's half, yeah. of, half of the audience. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe for, for the other 50%. Uh, apart from being a, a, a scenario writer for Hollywood and Muppet shows, who is Charles Dickens? <laughs> right, well, apart from that, there's not really very much to say. No. I think that you really pretty much summed him up. Um, well, the reason I chose Bleak House as my book is, I mean, Great Expectations is, is a wonderful book of his. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe his greatest book. He thought it was his greatest book. And that's probably the one that most of you guys have read, right? Great Expectations, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist. Um, all those are great ones. But the reason I picked Bleak House is that it's, it's the grandest of all his novels. It's the most technically virtuosic and it really speaks, I think, to us today in a way that a lot of his novels don't. But it's sort of an unloved novel. It's not read as much as, mm -hmm. I think, as some of his others, which is really too bad, because I think people are put off by just, just because of its length, whereas it's one of his most readable books. So when did you first uh, read a book by him? I, the first Dickens I read was Oliver Twist, and it was thought to be kind of a punishment in my family to... How old were you? I was about, um, I was in the third, fourth grade, mm -hmm. you know, which is, my grandmother was reading it to me, and as a reward, she, my mother had been read Oliver Twist at about the same age, and the, my mother said, well, you know, my grand, you know, read her a chapter of Nancy Drew, you know, like let her have a chapter of Oliver Twist and then a chapter of Nancy Drew. But very soon, I, I mean, I liked Nancy Drew, but I was really worried about Oliver Twist in a way I wasn't <laughs> about Nancy Drew. I mean, Oliver was in terrible danger. It was a novel with real blood. It was scarier than anything I'd ever seen on television. Mm -hmm. um, or it was quite a frightening book and really got into my bloodstream in a way. And... And then you thought, I want, I want more of that. Yeah, yeah, I did, and have loved him ever since, yes. And when did you get to Bleak House? You know, I saved Bleak House because it was... I had a terrible realization when I was in my 20s that someday they were all going to be gone, and I was going to be sick or in the hospital, or I was going to want a, another Dickens to read, and there wasn't going to be another one. <laughs> And it was the greatest one, and I saved it for last. I read it when, for the first time when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, about. After you finished The Secret History, you started reading mm -hmm. Bleak House. I, hadn't, I actually hadn't read Bleak House when I, when I was okay. writing The Secret History. Okay. So, before we continue, Tuan, we have an infographic. Can you please... Oh, you've missed that. We always have an infographic. So the second reader, it's Tuan, he will uh, explain what the book is about. Uh, with the help of an infographic. Which is impossible. Impossible. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. That's why I picked it. It's a hard sell. It's a hard, it's a hard book to it's, explain to it's people. A, it's a great book, but you just can't explain it. There are so many subplots. And but you do have an infographic. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. You made it, so yeah. uh, I'll explain it. Uh, I think the people on the bottom, they, um, they uh, represent all the different characters and subplots, but the basis of the book is a court case. Uh, Jarndyce, do I say Jarndyce? Or Jarndyce versus Jarndyce. Yes. And also must say that Kafka, when he was writing the mm -hmm. trial, also very, very influenced by this horrific court case yeah. that goes on and on and on and on. And it really sort of, it's corporate, corporate bureaucracy. It actually speaks very much to a lot of what's going on today. Yeah. The, the, the horrificness of this court case that, that never, never ends. Okay, so that, that's the basis What's the court the case about? Um, there's somebody who made different wills, and this court case, it lasts the, for it, 30 it, it years. It is like Kafka. You don't yeah. ever really understand. We always assume that people here haven't read any books. Yeah. That's our, that's our, our core, core audience, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't that's use good. literary reference, references. So they have so, no idea who Kafka is, so the, or they don't know the process. Well, there are a lot of illiterate <laughs> people in this book, too. That's okay. actually a huge theme. <laughs> in, so this should interest the illiterate folks in the audience. Okay. Um, that's for you. The... Um, Illiteracy is a huge mm -hmm. theme in Bleak House as well because there are lots of people who can't read and who are sort of moving around the... Part of the, the plot deals with stolen letters and um, Lady, Lady Deadlock, who's the, you know, the, the sort of grand removed figure, uh, married to this well-meaning but decent man, but she's had a racy past. Anyway, <laughs> she sees that... Um, her former lover, who is an opium addict, and uh, he has to make his living by sort of as a law copyist, she sees his handwriting on some letters, some papers of her husband's, and is desperate to find out who mm -hmm. did it. Desperate. And the old man who has the letters can't read, but he knows that, he, he knows that he's got something, but his trying to sort of make them out um, is 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 very. He knows what they're worth, but he doesn't. He doesn't know what they are. And the little street boy named Joe, who is the go-between, he doesn't read either. Mm -hmm. So it's it's about reading and not reading. It's about uh, legibility and and um, the, the 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 whole city of of, of Bleak House is. It's fog bound. It starts with this amazing description of fog and. Fog in those days, they, they called it pea soup fog because it was really green. Apparently, mm -hmm. the color of it was it was just horrific sort of industrial poisoning. Yeah. And yeah. so the city itself is shrouded in mystery. Things sort of come out of... That's, it's a very labyrinthine book and mm -hmm. very... Um, you never know what's around the corner. It's really the, one of the first mysteries. It's it's a it's a real precursor to the mystery yeah. novel. In so okay, so you were you were thirty. You've you've published *The Secret History*. It's a big success, and you you have a a, a moment of solitude, and you you grab *Bleak House*. And why why what did you love about *Bleak House*? Why did it was it the, the great expectations you had because you saved it till your to your thirtieth or? It was, it was that, but it is, I think, also the greatest one. Um, I was glad that I read it when I was old enough to understand it. It was good that I saved it, because some of, some of the ones I read, I, I was too young to... You understand some of it, but you don't understand all of it. I was glad that I waited. Um, but there, there's so much in this book. Um, this book is the closest thing to time travel that you'll ever experience. It really is being in the London of his day. And how, why, why, do, how does it happen? Just the, you can see the labels on the cans, you can see everything. He, he describes everything and he does it so lightly that you don't even realize that he's doing it. Mm -hmm you have the experience of walking through this great, dark, labyrinthine London, and you smell the smells and the, the mud in the streets, and it's a London of contagion and smallpox and, and, and disease. And, but also, Chancery, Jarndyce itself, that, that, that case is a kind of contagion because it wrecks the life of everyone who touches it. Everyone who's, who is involved in that case, they die. It kills people <laughs> off. They wait their whole lives. They think they're 
They, they, they speak of their judgment day, when it, judgment it, it is coming. It just goes on and on, I think, for 30 years. And, and Dickens has some great descriptions about that. And in the beginning of the book, there's an incredible quote about how long, actually, this court case lasts. And it says, uh, the little plaintiff who was promised a new rocking horse when Jarndyce versus Jarndyce should be settled has now grown up possessed himself of a real horse and trotted away Way into, into the, the, the next world. <laughs> yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> but it, it's so incredibly funny. F it's for, very funny. For you, it was your last Dickens. For me, it was my first Dickens. I never read Dickens before. And I had to laugh so much. It's just what you told about the details, it's amazing. I can understand why they keep making movies of his stories because... The story itself is a movie. Yes. There, there's this great description in the book where they're sitting in front of the fire and then they describe the fire as the fire winked its red eyes at us like a drowsy old chancery lion. And I can see the fire making that wink at us like a lion, a drowsy lion, almost sleeping. And he does that all the time. Just everything in Dickens is alive. Chairs, plates, yeah. tables, ev everything. Everything in every, every room. Is, everything is crooks and mm -hmm. all the, there's no level floors. And no, that's what exactly. I love about it. It's, no, every, it's everyone so has a lamp or a cast yeah. in their eye. Or a, it, but it's not caricature. It's, it's, it's not caricature at all. No. It, it, it's, it's very close seeing. Yeah, it's, it's so many details. And it's just amazing how he keeps... There are a lot of details. There's so many... <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> you, Bleak House in 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you also talked about understanding the book and that you were happy that you saved it because you could fully understand the book. What, what was there to understand? What is, that you, what is something that you learned from Well, I thought book? we were supposed to stay away from details, so I might have to pass on that no. question. <laughs> <laughs> no, just not too details much details. are good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's psychologically very complex. I mean, part of the... This has to do... I don't want to give uh, the secret away of, of bleak house uh, to people who haven't read it, but there is a great surprise at the end of Bleak, which, was, which I was thunderstruck by. But it, it's something I wouldn't have gotten fully as a child. It's something I wouldn't have, have, have fully understood the repercussions of. Something that would have been very shocking to a Victorian audience and was pretty shocking to, it's, it's pretty shocking to a modern reader as well. Okay, but if you can't... <laughs> No, we better not talk about it. It's, a, it's one of those bad detail kind of things. We better, yeah. Who, oh, whose good. perspective yeah. did you like the most? Because the book has actually two perspectives, and that's a strange thing, because most books have one narrator. And, and most critics actually don't like the... Esther. Um, yeah. But I love her. I, I like Esther, too. <laughs> I, 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 I'm fond of Esther, but, you know, she's thought to be the first unreliable narrator in British uh, fiction. Why, why, why is that? Well, because... Well, Esther is trying to find out who she is, who her parents... The reader figures out a good bit before Esther what the yes. deal is. And again, that's something we, we, we can't tell. But, <laughs> um, Read it. Esther can be a little bit cloying, you know, she's a little bit the Victorian angel in the yeah. house. And she's so good. She's so good, uh, yeah. You really like the same things in books? What? You guys. Ah, yeah. yeah. Did you well, like the names? I loved them. The I names them. are great. Yeah. <laughs> you have Mr. Skimpole. Crook, Mr. Crook. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Crook right, is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Skimple, uh, Mr. Skimpo, it's like the name says it all. In Dutch, uh, we would call him the Uitvreter. And, and actually, when uh, I was in high school, people that were like cheap, we called them Skimpy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any Skimpy. name from the book you like to uh, highlight? I want to hear this. This is actually really interesting. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's <laughs> listen to Twang. <laughs> yeah. You meet Mr. Skimpo, and he can like amaze everybody with his... With his 
philosophy of life. Another name. Give us another name. But, but no, but he never, but the thing about Mr. Skimpole, he's great. He's cheap. He never pays for anything. Yeah. He's, he can't be bothered. He can never find God, his, God. yeah, he can, he can never find his pocketbook uh, uh, and he'd be uh, delighted to pay for oh, this. Oh, sorry, movie. sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. But, he's, but he, he's just a child. He's, yeah, that's he's, what he's, he, he's, 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 he's only a child. He, he can't wants be to enjoy to the butterflies. Exactly. He's, he's, he's too, he's enjoying things yeah. too much. And he actually bottle. makes other people feel good. Because they can pay for him, and so exactly. they feel good. Exactly, and it's an honor and to pay. Everybody for Mr. knows it's an Mrs. Skimpole. Everyone knows yeah. it, but and some people don't itself? find it quite as much an honor. Some people think, well, maybe I'm a little sick of paying for Harold Skimpole at this point. But, but those people, they yeah. they, they don't understand. It him. would be no. so easy in real life if you could recognize character by names, like in Dickens. You're like, oh, that's a dodgy name. I might want to stay out of there. Well, I don't know. I mean, I have an interesting last name. Tars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't comment on that. I have nothing to say. Nothing to say. Yes. I guess we're done then. I guess we're done. I know. Yeah. Can't uh, get uh, much better than that. That's a good, good uh, lead out. <laughs> Tuan, you guys like each other. You, may, you have to write for the last question. Well, I I just have some great quotes here, but I can't <laughs> read them myself. Well, I, I think... It, uh, it's your job to ask the questions. It's my job. Yeah, but job sometimes... I'm going to sit here polite. I'm ask, me, ask me your question. That's a, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to think about this one. <laughs> I, you know, I totally blanked out because of, of, of this, you know? I have to ask a question now. And you will answer it, but then I know when you answer it, Tuan will say, yeah, I feel exactly the same. <laughs> yes. And then I'll be sitting here, and the whole answer will be gone. So I don't maybe, dare... Maybe you can go away, and we just... Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a good idea. You ask the last question, I'll, I'll wait next to the stage. Th th that's not my job. Tuan, where are you going, Ernst? Come on. We've hurt his feelings. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Back, it's, I've, I've got all my things. We feel bad. Oh, yeah. We it's didn't mean to. No. Well, uh, Mr. Notard, we, I asked you what the weirdest Dutch guy you, was you ran into the last week. I think if I ask you the question, who was the loveliest Dutch guy you ran into <laughs> this week, I know the answer. Maybe. Oh, Donna. Thank you very much. <laughs> the bar is right over there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Donna Tart and Van Dong.